Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for tuning in for this midweek service. I want to give God praise because he helped us and touched us yes, Sunday with the service, but also with the going home rejoicing celebration of Brother Joe Christie and minister to the family. And we just had their graveside service Tuesday, and thankfully God is keeping them. His grace is sufficient. Continue to remember them in prayer that God will strengthen them because the journey has just begun. Their life will never, never be the same again. But the Lord is coming, and that's all that matters. I'm going to minister tonight for a short while. As long as I got wind and the Lord help me, out of the book of Joshua, the second chapter, I want to read the seventh through the eleventh verse. The scripture says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath, Harris, in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. I want to talk for a short while this evening about the other generation. If there's ever been a time my heart has been heavy and burdened for the last several months, a year, about the spiritual fever of the church, the body of Christ, I'm not just talking about my local church. I'm talking about the church overall, the church of the living God, the ecclesia. There's ever been a time that I've been concerned about the fervency of our spirituality, the hunger and desire to witness the power and the glory of God, the signs and wonders, the miracles, the things that are indescribable, the things that we cannot even conjure up in our imagination what God can and would do and wants to do. It's the day we're living in. And my heart is so burdened and I'm so torn because I believe the generation that we have today is reflected in Joshua, the second chapter. A generation that does not know God. They know him by pronunciation of his name. They know him by association of the church, they know him but the heritage of their family. Oh, oh, but they don't know him intimately. They don't know him one-on-one. -on -one. They don't know him with all their heart. They don't recognize his voice. They don't sense when his power and spirit is moving over when he's calling them and trying to lead them. They don't sense his closeness through the trial and the battles and surely don't seek his refuge during the opportunities of temptation. And I'm concerned about a generation that has forgotten God. Father, I magnify you. I love you. You're everything. Oh, God. I want this present generation to be able to witness and experience the things I did in my youth when I got saved. When you gloriously redeemed me and delivered me and set me free and wrote my name down in the land of your life. More than anything, Lord, I want to be witness. I've seen a generation that is stirred by your presence and the outpouring of your power and glory. 
And see a younger generation that's taking the reins and leading worship and seeking you and allowing them to be the vehicle, the vessel, the instrument for your glory and righteousness. Help us, Lord, today to stir ourselves as elders, as the church of yesterday, to stir ourselves to impact the church of today, that they may know him instead of being a generation that knew not the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the book of Judges, the nation of Israel has a cycle they go through. God blesses them and guides them and leads them. And they get prosperous in their leading and following of the Lord. And then when they get prosperous, they forget about God. They'll put on their bondage by their enemies and become into slavery. And they cry out to God and ask him for deliverance and mercy. And God, out of his mercy, hears him and comes down and mightily, divinely delivers them. And once they're free and start prospering, they forsake him again. And then they cry out once more again and seek God and plead with him to show mercy. And God does it. They just go right back into the bondages again. They forget about God. They take their prosperity and their blessings and they get so wrapped up that they forget about him and end up back in, in bondage. It's a continual cycle. We can't allow this to continue in the present day. You see, all the days of Joshua, a man who God had called, a man who loved him, a man who was willing to put everything on the line for his God in the name of his God. And they, they followed Joshua as their leader. And under his leadership, they saw great things. They saw the hand and the power of God. If you remember, they saw the Jordan River dried up in the flood season so they could cross over on dry ground. They saw the mighty walls of Jericho call fall flat without picking up a sword, without doing anything but just being obedient and marching around that city. And on the seventh day, on the seventh time, magnifying his name in these walls of this impenetrable city, fortress, came down flat and they were able to go in and conquer it. They saw God fight through his power, the five kings and Amorites, and destroy them as he sent large hailstones down and devoured them all. They heard the prayer of Joshua during the battle and cried out to the Lord to have the sun stand still. And for a day the sun never went down, they witnessed the mighty miraculous intervention of God through the prayer of their leader. They saw their enemies subdued before them. They realized, oh my God, this is unbelievable. And they were the generation that experienced the power of God. They were the generation that virtually because of their adversaries were forced to trust God. Their enemies were greater than them. Their resources was very limited and scarce. And they were forced to trust God and lean upon him. And when they did, my God, he brought them through everything. They were the generation that seen through the intervention and the leading and the power of God to conquer the land that God had promised them. Even against the giants and over all the, all the enemy and the tribes and the, and the forces, they conquered the land by his glorious power. But in the midst of it, they went through many hardships, and many valleys and struggles. They had to make many sacrifices. They experienced the faithfulness of God in every situation and circumstance when they were obedient and submissive and gave him glory and recognition. They were through God, the generation that all reap benefits, benefits and blessings from the mighty hand and blessings of God. You see, they had hard fought battles, but the next generation was a different mindset. They weren't the same. You see, they heard about the stories 
They heard about the testimonies. They heard about the things that God had done. They would see the pile of stones that were brought out of the River Jordan and heard the story of the miraculous innovation how God dried up that river, stopped the flowing until they walked across on dry ground by the mighty hand of God. They could go by and see the ruins of the city of Jericho that once was a, a metropolis, a, a city that was up on the hill, a city that was so dynamic and knew that it was once locked down could not be penetrable. No force could go in there until the children of Israel who weren't a mighty fighting company. They were former slaves and just a people called by God but anointed by him went in there and took down the city and they seen the ruins and how the, the walls had fallen flat. They heard the stories and the testimonies about the power and the glory of God coming into their midst. But they never experienced the power of God. They never experienced firsthand the glory, the presence of God moving them in such a place that fear gripped them and reverence gripped them. You see, they were so busy in reaping the benefits and developing the land that God had given them, the promise that God had given them, that they forgot about worshiping and serving him, giving him glory and honor and reminding themselves where it all came from. They had uh, grew up from the affluence. They were dwelling safely in cities that they never, not only built, but never had to conquer themselves. They were eating fruits of the vine that they never had to plant. They were enjoying the abundant riches that their fathers had taken from the enemies and been blessed in abundance. They were just living in if we call the South High Cotton, oh, but they never experienced the hardship, the total dependency upon Jehovah God. They never learned what it was to have to trust in Him. They were a generation that said they could, and sometimes would, but they never knew what it was to have to trust in God. They didn't experience all the hardships they didn't understand and were deceived to realize that all the benefits they had were handed to them by others that walked up straight and narrow, that had pursued God with everything. And in the midst of their enjoying of their blessings, they had more time to pursue their pleasure and their lust than they did to pursue God and to know him in a great manner. You see, all these things were handed to them. And their prosperity continued and continued because God honored the lives and sacrifices of their fathers until this 10th verse, the generation of the 10th verse, the other generation, that when they rose up, they knew not the Lord nor yet the works which he had done. They didn't know God. They never experienced him works. You see, they'd fallen into compromising and complacency. It got to the place that they just wanted the benefits without any sacrifices. They felt like they were entitled. Does it not remind you of today's culture? That they were entitled, that because of who they were, that they ought to be able to get these things right on. You see, when as they come along, their generation after them was even worse. For their children did not even hear the testimonies about the Red Sea and how God had parted it. They didn't hear about how God had given the, the laws of God to Moses on the tablets on the mount. And he came down mightily when he was in the presence of God. They didn't hear the stories of the victory that God wrought against their enemies 
because God made the sun stand still so they could continue in battle and night wouldn't be a shield for the enemies to flee but they were able to chase them down and destroy them all you see their fathers before them had not kept the commandments of making sure that they offered sacrifices to God and shared the testimony and the, and the, and the, and the wonders of what God had done and while they were making these sacrifices while the sacrifice of the Passover and how at the Passover they sacrificed the male child, the first male child without blemish. They sacrificed it unto God. And how God had honored them and blessed them and brought them out and delivered them. Oh, they didn't tell the story about how God slew the firstborn of all the Egyptians and God got their attention. They didn't talk about all the things that God had done. In Deuteronomy 6, this is what the Lord said. When your son shall ask you in the time to come, what are these testimonies and these statutes and judgments which the Lord our God commanded you? Then you will say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed great and awesome signs and wonders in Egypt, and upon Pharaoh and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us up out from there, that he might bring us into this land which he swore to our fathers to give to us. And the Lord commanded us to do all these things, to all these statues. The Lord commanded us to fear the Lord our God for all that was blessing and all that was done was done to preserve us and keep us alive. They didn't hear that's the reason why Joshua pulled up some stones from the Muddy Creek bed and took it out of the river of Jordan and piled them up. That they could be a sign, a witness, unto generation after generation of the mighty deliverance of the hand of Almighty God. That they could let them know that the water of Jordans had cut us off and was overrunning its banks. And we were surely in desperation until the feet of the priests taking the ark across touched the water. And the ark of God being carried by the priests, the waters parted and gave reverence. And we walked across on dry ground and God delivered his people and kept us. You see, and all the things that they had received, they failed to put their prosperity in the right place and obey the commandments of God. They had fallen into spiritual apathy. And spiritual apathy always leads to apostasy. That's the day we're living. We've been so busy about our pleasures and our benefits and our blessings, our good fortune. We've been so blessed with the beautiful sanctuaries and the wonders. I remember when I first got saved back in the early 70s, you know, a family would be blessed to have a nice car. Very few had new cars and most people in the church didn't have two cars. And when their children come of age, they drive their parents' car for a while. When their parents could save up enough money They'd buy him an old clunker. They'd drive that car proud. My first car was a 1963 Buick LeSabre four-door. Outside was faded paint and a little bit of rust, but the inside was clean. But I was so proud, I would wax it, even though it wouldn't have any luster. I would wash it, even though it wouldn't shine. But it was my car. I was proud of what I had. Oh, listen, we're living in a time when they've been so blessed this generation that there's more than two or three cars in the driveway. We're building three and four car garages and our children are driving better cars than our parents used to drive. We're going out and spending tens of thousands of dollars to give them a car that they're probably going to wreck and don't even appreciate and then complain that we can't pay our tithes and 
Don't know how we're going to make ends meet. We can't give in offerings for missions and special offerings. Can't afford to do the things that God has called us to do, and yet we can purchase the things that we choose and deem to. And so there was this generation that rose up, knew not Joseph, I mean Jehovah, and they attempted their best to just allow God to fade out of their history. That's what happened to this generation. They haven't seen the mighty miracles and power of God, the glory of God to come in until the doorposts are shaken. They haven't seen an experience when the Holy Ghost swoops in and slays people in between the pews and in the aisles. They haven't witnessed when the Holy Ghost comes down and anoints someone so dynamically that they run the back of the pews get to the back pew and spit around and come back while people are sitting on the pews. And, and when they step on their shoulders, the people can't even feel the weight of those that are running. They haven't experienced the miraculous of signs and wonders and miracles being manifested in their midst until they stand in awe. Oh, I'm telling you, God is being erased. And they found that it's easier to serve other gods like the children of Israel. They served Balaam and the other gods. They fell out with God because it required sacrifice and obedience and crucifying of the flesh. This generation don't want to crucify the flesh. This generation wants nothing but pleasure and leisure. This generation wants everything handed to them. This generation don't know what it is to trust God for each and everything and to lean upon him for all things. They don't know what it is to know that if they'll cry out to God, he'll deliver in the midst of all impossibilities. Oh, their idea of healing is going to the ER or getting some medication out of the pharmacy. They don't know what it is to lay on of hands and receiving Oh, I'm telling you, they don't have a hunch and a desire and a thirst to seek for the gift of the Holy Ghost. That gift out that will empower them, allow the nine gifts of the Holy Ghost to operate to the fruits of the Spirit to manifest itself, that they can be the light and the salt of the earth like God has commanded them. They're ashamed to testify and witness that they're so in love with their God and there isn't another. That they're not going to bow or bend. That their, their code of living, whether it be dress or relationships or habitation or places of, of, of uh, entertainment will be regulated by the guidelines of the Holy Word of God and the Holy Ghost convicting power. That if God doesn't find pleasure in it, I will not do it. That the Holy Ghost convicts me it don't matter. If everyone else does it, I'm not going to do it. They don't know what that is. You see, they've gotten so busy. Oh, they've, they've allowed themselves to sell off their heritage and the, and the relationships that the generation before them once knew. They don't realize that the Lord's coming back for a church without a spot or a or wrinkle. They're deceived and blinded that they think they're all right. Even though Jesus warned deception would be the first tool of the enemy. They compare themselves to others instead of comparing themselves to the word of God and the spirit of God. They compare themselves to others and find faults in them and flaw in them because they're doing the same. And when they find their flaws and faults, they justify their darkness. They justify their areas that have, have sin or disobedience. They justify it where they understand that they've gotten accustomed to the dark of their lives, but they can find the fault in everyone else. They've lined themselves up with others instead of doing as David said, search me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God. Search me, O oh God. And if there be any wicked thing in me, oh God, oh, 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 if there be any wicked thing, oh, God, in me, cleanse me, 
created me, oh God, a clean heart. I'm not the a keeper of my soul, Lord. You are. You're the physician. You're the one who's going to give me the examination. It's your scales I'm going to stand upon and see if I find whether I'm in want or I come out in equalness. Oh, God, I want to know whether I've got favor with you. The world can line up, but it don't matter. For what shall it profit me if I gain the whole, whole world, all the fame and fortune and accolades, all the recognition, all the wealth, if I gain it all and, watch and lose my soul, what have I gained? And then to pursue more, what shall I give in exchange for my soul? An eternal soul that shall never die, that will spend eternity either in the blisses of the eternal home of God, in the city of God, in the presence of the Most High Throne of God and of the saints and the angels, or in the eternal damnable flames of hell with Satan and all his imps and all the unrighteous that forgot God, all the nations have forgot God. One of the two places we shall spend God, what shall I give in exchange for my soul? For hell and all this misery and torments. Think about it. What would you take and trade? What is in your life keeping you from wanting to be totally surrendered and sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ? What is it that would hinder you, hamper you, restrict you, hold you back, make you lose heart? Do not want to tell the world about your God and the wonder of what he's done, your testimony. Share it aloud. Lift up your voice and let everybody know, come and let me tell you about a man who delivered me. What is it that would hold you back? Because whatever, whatever it is, I want you to know whatever it is, you can, you can uh, uh, title it and you can identify it. That's your God. You've put it ahead of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's your God. You see, anytime you serve false gods, you go into bondage. And that's what's taking place. It's the trend of humanity. The first generation has an experience with God. They have an experience with God where he comes down in the midst of their turmoil and their bondages and their weeping and sorrows and brokenness, in the midst of their strongholds. And he hears their plea and he delivers them out of his mercy and raises them up. And then the second generation is protected by the first. We tried to guard them from the pitfalls that we fell into and ward off the enemy that comes in like a wolf in sheep clothing. We try to put up hedges about them to try to keep them safe. And so they hear our testimonies and they hear about the experiences we have, but they've never had them themselves. And then the third generation because the second generation never had the experience themselves, allow themselves to go into spiritual amnesia and don't even share the stories of the first generation. And the third generation never hears the testimonies, never sees the tokens, never sees the pile of stones, never hears about the things that God had did in the, generation before them. Ah, oh, they don't see the sacrifices that's made by the second generation because they've learned not to have to depend. Oh, depend on God and the Spirit of God. They depended on mama and daddy, grandma and grandpa, and from the blessings that God poured upon them, they just turned to them. We've catered them. We aided and, and, and abetted them. 
We've, we've taken and, and assisted them. Oh my God. Until they've never had to lean upon him and make sacrifice for God. So therefore they have nothing to tell. There is no testimony. They have too much pride to repeat the testimony of their generation before them. And so they say nothing. And they know not God. And like our text, they, they arise and know not the Lord, neither the works thereof. Listen, all they can talk about are their, their parents, the second generation, is from past tense experiences, the things that God had done. Anything they can repeat has to be past tense instead of now and individual and personal. Oh, listen, we must keep a constant, current, intimate relationship with the Lord. We must insist that our children, the second generation, do the same. We must pursue God and, 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 and seek them and challenge them to pursue God also. Pursue God and warn them what they're going to do to their own children. We need to have them recognize a fresh new move of God in their lives, a fresh touch, a fresh anointing. Not yesterday's uh, uh, re hurt, re uh, eats, not yesterday's leftovers, but an experience of God. This is what Jeremiah said in Lamentations, the third chapter, the 22nd verse. It is in the Lord's mercies that we're not consumed. Because his compassions, they fail not. That's what we need to tell this young generation. The only reason why you're not consumed by the gods of this world and the Antichrist is because God's compassions fail not. Jeremiah said they are new every morning. Every morning, great. Great is our faithfulness. Each morning we should seek a new fresh touch of God, a new intervention, a new work of his ability in our lives and share that testimony. We must tell them and we make sure we tell the second and the third generation. Listen, if your children, first generation, if your children of the second generation don't want to share your story, grandpa, grandma, you sit your grandchildren down and make them listen. Cut off the TV, the tablet, and that, and say, listen, you're going to hear a testimony of what God did in my life. They need to hear your story. If their parents won't tell them, don't pass it on and pass the buck. Do it yourself. Because if they don't hear your stories, if they don't hear your testimony, if they don't experience your witness, There'll be the generation, that generation that will not know God. They'll be left by God. I don't want my grandchildren left. I don't want my children left. I want to make sure they hear the story over and over. Ah, oh, they might get to the place that they can mimic me, but that's what I want them to do. Because there'll come a time when I'm no longer and I want my testimony to live on through them and my grandchildren. And then into my great-grandchildren, if the Lord was a terror, which I don't believe he will. So I want you to know we need to take the sincere guard. Listen what the writer of Hebrews said. Let us take the earnest heed and do the things that we have heard, lest we should let them drift away. You see, if we're not careful, we can be like the church at Ephesus. Where the Lord told them, you've got all these things, but I've got something against you. You've left your first love. The things you're doing is out of habit. But it's not out of love. It's not out of obedience and submission. Because you're in love with me. And when you lose your love for Jesus, you'll become apathetic. And, and then you, you'll just lean, get lean and drift away into apostasy. Until the things that you once stood for, you'll no longer stand for. The things that you was adamant about resisting, now you're welcome. The things that you would declare would damn a soul, now you'll justify and support. 
I'm telling you, we're living in the last days. Oh, it starts first by losing that intimacy, that, that fervency, that desire to be close to him. That's the first step to backsliding. When you're no longer fervent as you once were, you're not as hungry for God as you once were. It's okay if you don't make it to Sunday school, the Bible study hour, to learn of God. Listen, the Bible study hour, the Sunday school hour, is an opportunity to have the Word of God taught that you can learn of Him. That you can learn of Him. And if you don't have that desire, you're backsliding. You're backsliding. If you don't have a hunger and an irresistible desire to be in the house of God, to not only receive, but to give forth and share, to utilize your talents and your strengths and your reinforcement, you're backsliding. You might get mad, you might not like it, but prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. We're not an island. We're a body of believers. What good is my hand without the rest of my body? What good is my heart without the rest of my body? What good is my mind if I can quote the entire word of God without the rest of my body? We need one another. We are the body of Christ. And if your hand is not here, it hinders the rest of the body. You're important. The devil will tell you you're not. He'll tell you, no, you're not important. He'll tell you you're not even missed, but that's a lie. He's an accuser of the brethren. He'll tell you a lie. You are missed. You're necessary. You're needed. Oh, listen. If you hurt your foot, your limp, you're still going with your limp. And if, you, if, if, if people don't do their part in the house of God, we're not going to shut the doors and sell the property. We'll make do with what we got. If our singers don't show up, if our musicians don't show up, if our altar workers don't show up, if the people on the pews and the interceders and the greeters, if they don't show up, if you don't pay your tithes, if you don't do your part, we'll make do one way or another. But we won't be the loser. You will be. And so we need to get hungry for God. We need to allow God to move in a dynamic way. We need to say, God, once again, let me behold your power and your glory signs and wonders that this generation that is forgetting or has already forgotten God can experience him. The Bible said they knew not the Lord nor yet the works of the, that he had done. One translation says they knew not the Lord this generation because they never witnessed the power and the glory of God in their midst. So tonight, I plead with you, where are you at? Identify this generation that knows not God and plead with me the blood of Christ that their eyes will be opened and we can usher them in, into a relationship, an intimacy with the Spirit of God and the power of the Holy Ghost and the gift of baptism of the Holy Ghost they could be the instruments, the tool, the, the vessels that God uses to magnify his glory in these last days. It's up to you, Father. I thank you because you've helped me. I haven't done service to this message as I wanted, but you know I've done the best I possibly could. I love you. I'm asking for the anointing to do what I'm in limited of doing. I'm asking for the Holy Ghost to bring forth the message that I was attempting to bring out and highlight. And Father, stir us because you're coming. Your coming is soon. And there's a generation that knows not God. Knows not God. And that generation will be cursed. And the generation that failed to pass on the witness and the testimony will be cursed with them. Help us, God, to
to deliver us from the curse and behold your power and glory in Jesus' name. Don't forget to come to Sunday School Bible Study Hour Sunday at 10. Sunday morning I will be picking back up. I'll be ministering about these last days. I'm in Revelations. I'm going to share the things that are taking place. Show them how they're tying in. You need to hear it. You need to be aware of it. It'll let you be just how close the rapture is. God bless you and thank you.